Hi, everyone. Um, have a wonderful afternoon. Um, so I apologize right before this, uh, I started having internet issues. So I'm joining here from my phone, so I don't have a slide to share. But I'm super excited um, to be representing Elastic. Uh, my name is Stephanie Nissen, and I run Elastic for Students and Educators. So I will hopefully push this slide out to you so you'll get all of that important information, but really just wanted to welcome you and let you know that Elastic, if you don't know what we are, that's quite all right. I'll share that information with you. Um, but we have a program that's dedicated specifically to supporting students and educators in education. Um, we provide product access, training and support, um, everything for free, just as a way for you to get more involved with Elastic, to learn our software, to hopefully diversify your skill set and make you more employable. So we really just, um, we're super excited to be here. Obviously, um, women in tech is a huge uh, focus area for Elastic um, and supporting events like this. So hopefully um, we will connect in the future. Once again, I will make sure my information gets out to you um, at some point, somehow. Um, but um, Without further ado, I am privileged enough to introduce your speakers here today, Jason and Lori. So Jason Fagone is a journalist and author, currently the narrative writer of the San Francisco Chronicles. His stories have appeared in The Atlantic, The New York Times Magazine, Wired, GQ, and Grantland. His most recent book, The Woman Who Smashed Codes, about the puzzle-solving war hero and cryptographic pioneer Elizabeth Friedman, was named one of NPR's best books for 2017 and inspired the PBS documentary, The Code Breaker. In 2014 to 2015, he was a Knight Wallace Fellow in Journalism at the University of Michigan. So welcome, Jason. Our other panelist discussion, um, Attendee is Lori, uh, so Lori Burns McRobbie. As I use 18th First Lady, Lori is an active ambassador for Indiana University. I apologize, my screen is totally frozen right now, so <laughs> I can't read the rest of the bio. Um, but I will say I interacted with Lori just a little bit um, and um, just a wonderful person and is really, you know, the, the brains behind this operation and I know is so excited to be here. I apologize, Lori, that I cannot finish your bio, um, but I am going to turn it back over to you guys. Um, once again, I will make sure that you get the information about Elastic. We're super excited to sponsor here today and look forward to this talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Stephanie. And no worries on on the bio. I um, personally, I'm I'm really tired of hearing my own bio <laughs> all the time. And more important that you have introduced Jason, um, who is really the the star of the show here. Um, welcome everyone, and um, and thank you again, Stephanie and Elastic, for sponsoring this session. Um, Jason, especially thanks to you for coming in from San Francisco. It's a bit earlier there for you this morning. Um, uh, we're just uh, delighted that, you've, um, that you're here. And of course, that you have uh, written this incredible book about Elizabeth Friedman, um, an Indiana na native, although sadly not an Indiana University alum, but we'll forgive her for that. We've adopted her. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. You know, I just want to say I, I am uh, I'm so excited to talk to you today, and I can't tell you how thrilled I am about the Indiana connection. You know, um, the fact that Elizabeth is being, you know, discussed and honored at at, uh, at IU in her home state, I think is huge. Um, I know that she would be amazed by this, and I, I know that her uh, surviving Indiana family really appreciate it. Um, yeah, yeah, she still has family in the Fort Wayne area. Huntington, where she was born, is just south of Fort Wayne, and and partly, I mean, due to your efforts and those of a, a few others who have gotten on, joined the Elizabeth Friedman fan, fan club, like myself, um, have discovered that you know there are these still these connections. Um, she only passed away in the 1970s, I think, right, 1970s or 80s. So, um, still, still is kind of with us. Well, let let's just start. Um, we're going to have a conversation for a little bit, and um, probably in about uh, half an hour or so, we'll open things up for questions from the audience. Um, but let's just start kind of at the beginning. What led you to Elizabeth? How did you first learn about her, and and what what drew you into her story? Yeah, I uh, I love telling the story. So um, so thank you, Laurie. First of all, th thanks to you. Thanks to uh, Seaway. Thanks to everyone at IU who organized this summit. I know it's a large team and a big effort, and uh, I'm really impressed with your your efforts on women in tech and your leadership. So thank you. Um, 
so the short answer to your question is is luck and, and curiosity is what got me into this uh, this topic. I sort of found this thread um, that I wasn't expecting to find, and I followed it, and this this whole kind of world opened up, um, and this incredible untold story uh, that was completely captivating to me. It, it started in 2013, and it kind of grew out of the uh, Edward Snowden disclosures that year. Um, I'm sure you remember Snowden was an NSA contractor. He revealed these um, sort of long secret uh, surveillance programs um, that were collecting large numbers of uh, phone records of sort of everyday Americans. Um, there was a lot of coverage of that. And at the center of it was this government agency, the National Security Agency, which has you know, long been one of the most secret. And so I was, I was just curious about the NSA and its history. And I started reading about the NSA. And when you read about the NSA, all roads uh, lead to a man named William Friedman. He's, he's sort of the, the godfather of the NSA. So I was reading this biography of William Friedman. He's said to be the, you know, one of the greatest American code breakers who ever lived, uh, someone who solved secret messages without knowing a key. And it mentioned that his wife was also a code breaker. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, I, I wonder if I can find more information about her, Elizabeth. Um, but I couldn't really find anything. And so, so I went looking and that search led me to a, um, to a private library in Virginia where Elizabeth had left 22 boxes of her personal papers um, before she died. And so, so I, I walked into the office, uh, into the library one day, and I started looking at her, um, her letters. And you know, almost immediately, I had this feeling that you get sometimes as journalist and author that you, you, you have you know, stumbled into an incredible piece of luck and that you had better you know, pay very close attention because you know, the story that started to you know, unfold in those letters was something that I had never heard before. Um, and it was, it was really wildly dramatic. You know, it was a story of this woman in her 20s um, who was not a mathematician, who was a poet, but she suddenly became one of the greatest code breakers America had ever seen. Um, she went on to help invent a new science of cryptology. And then she, um, you know, she used those insights to, you know, tackle the evils of her time. She caught gangsters by solving puzzles. Um, she helped win World War I, and she hunted Nazi spies in World War II. And um, and none of this had ever been known because of government secrecy and because, um, you know, men around her uh, tried to steal the credit for the things that she had done. So at that point, I was just kind of fully committed, and I, I, I needed to, uh, I knew I needed to do whatever. Uh, whatever it took to to get the story out yeah well and i we every, i i think about uh 500 of our the first enrollees for this conference first people to, to register got a copy of your book i hope those who haven't gotten a copy of it um rush right out and and get one uh and i don't know how many of our our members of our audience have had a chance to read it a, a great treat awaits you um, and I think, Jason, you've kind of summed up the outline of her story and why it is so captivating. But I think it's, for me, reading it, it was, it was her, her personality and her perseverance and just her brilliance that you really shine a light on throughout the book, which is, uh, makes, it, makes it such an incredible, uh, incredibly good read. So you, you had to go into these 22 boxes um, and, and it's sort of interesting to me knowing that uh, I, I kind of style myself as a kind of amateur historian. I've done a lot of, a lot of reading and a little bit of historical research over the time, over um, my, my life. Um, and I know that very often women don't keep their records, don't keep their papers. They don't, a lot of women, even, even very famous women, uh, Frances Perkins, who was the first woman to sit in a presidential cabinet um, you know, when FDR made her his secretary of labor. She burned some of her papers. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. Oh, wow. Yeah. So fortunately, there's a, plenty that, that it still exists. And so there's some very good biographies that are out there. But a lot of women didn't keep them. But Elizabeth did. Um, and yeah. uh, and so you were able to go and, and, to, and to tease the story out. Did you, um, did you have much experience going into archives? Not at all. I, I wasn't even an amateur historian. <laughs> you, you're, you're way far ahead of me there. Um, no, I studied uh, journalism in college, not, not history. And so I had to learn how to do all of this from scratch. Um, and I made a lot of mistakes, honestly, in the beginning. Um, you know, my, my biggest mistake was, was, was probably in these archives getting too excited because I would always get really excited when I found something, um, you know, that was revealing or surprising. And then I would, uh, 
I would want to show somebody, but you know, uh, these are library settings. You can't get excited. You can't stand up and scream, you know. Um, but uh, eventually, I learned how to how to navigate archives and special collections, um, you know, with the help of archivists who are some of the most wonderful people on earth. Um, and and it very quickly became uh, my favorite part of the project, kind of the, the detective search. You know, I felt almost like a history detective. And I'm sure you've had the same same feeling when you're in the archives. You know. You, you find a letter that references another letter that's not in that archive, but it's in some other archive, and you go to that other archive and you try to kind of piece them together, and then you know this become these become kind of facts in your tapestry, you know the narrative that you that you're trying to weave about about what really happened, and you're right that Elizabeth you know did keep a lot of her records, and it was it it showed a lot of foresight. I think that part of it was was just a kind of an ingrained habit that she had as a code breaker. Um, you know, as part of her professional practice, because um, she was breaking codes in the era of pencil and paper. This is long before computers ever entered the picture. So, so right. So, and this is one of the most incredible things about her to me is that this is a completely analog world. You know, you have to picture, you know, a woman in her twenties at a, at a desk with just a stack of graph paper and you know twenty sharpened pencils and and some large erasers because you're going to be erasing a lot, right? You make a lot of mistakes. And one of her, um, you know, dictums was that. You never throw anything away because when you're breaking codes by pencil and paper, you go down wrong alleys and you don't know how many of those wrong alleys will actually turn out to, you know, open a door to the to the solution. So you don't throw anything away. But at the same time, I, I do think that she had a sense that um, that what she was doing was, you know, if not groundbreaking, though it was, what she was doing was part of part of a, this bigger effort that was important. And so so she did keep all of this stuff, and I'm so glad because it, it's it's what allowed us to go in, um, you know, today and, and discover all of the amazing things that she did. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you say, she was one of the inventors of this field, which uh, we we sort of think about as I suppose generally as as cybersecurity, although cybersecurity covers a lot of kind of sub disciplines, um, and and code breaking is certainly in there and done very very differently today, of course. Um, but but can you say a little more, and, and maybe this is a, a partly a question about what kind of um, a background you brought to this project, whether you had you know, a pretty good sense of uh, what intelligence work was like during World War I and World War II and, and into the modern day. And so how, what Elizabeth was doing, the, the innovations that she was bringing to bear on this really were foundational for what we, do today to to um, well to, to to break codes and to uh, to discover things. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, a lot of a lot of what she invented, the methods that she uh, uh, co-invented with William and the ones she invented herself are, you know, they're not used in exactly that way by uh, people in the intelligence community in 2020. But the basic concepts are still part of the DNA of how intelligence work happens, right? Um, you know, she she helped to lay the foundation uh, of of how that work proceeds in a lot of these agencies. I, I didn't know much about intelligence history when I when I began. You know, I had read a little bit about it. I think I had absorbed uh, some sense of it through pop culture. You know, the, the story of Alan Turing at Bletchley Park in World War II. Right. Um, you know, I'd seen the imitation game, the movie with Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, you know, this is the this is the side of war that uh, Churchill called the shadow war. In reference to World War II, right? So not not the war of bombs and ships, but the secret war of spies and deception and codes and puzzles. That was Elizabeth's piece. So uh, when I started the project, I read a lot of the consensus histories of of um, you know World War II intelligence and code breaking um, that were written in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. I basically just tried to understand everything that had already been written, uh, and and a lot of those books are really great but they don't have a lot of information about the contributions of women so that i had to find for myself and when i when i started um there was there was no information available about what elizabeth had done in world war ii when i went to the library that had those 22 boxes there was this very conspicuous gap um between 1939 and 1946 which you know as a researcher if you see a gap between 1939 and 1946 you think oh that's that's really interesting, right? That's very suggestive. You know, some of that stuff might have been secret, um, and you really want to find out where it is. Nobody knew where it was. Um, 
but I suspected that Elizabeth had played some role in World War II because, you know, at the start of World War II, she was one of the best code breakers in America. She was, she was literally too good for the government to leave alone. Uh, she was kind of a secret weapon. So, um, so I went, I went looking for those records and it took me a, a year and a half. And that was probably the most fun um, and rewarding part of the project because it was basically a year and a half of going back and forth to um, archives two in College Park, Maryland, part of the National Archives System, and just, you know, which is which is an incredibly um, analog world still. It's like, I think I had this perception before I started the project that pretty much everything, um, every all the information in the world is on Google or, or Googleable or searchable in some sense. And that's absolutely not true. I mean, academics already know that, but I, I'm not an academic, right? So, um, so I had to learn how much of the, the world of paper uh, is still analog and National Archives is, you know, is not digitally searchable in any meaningful way. So I had to, I had to go hunting through pull slips for a year and a half, pulling boxes and hoping that, you know, the box that I pulled would have the treasure that I was looking for, which was, you know, the set of Elizabeth's World War II records. And then after, after a year and a half, I finally found two sets of records that allowed me to uh, piece together the, the story of what she did in World War II. And it was even more kind of, you know, adventurous, traumatic and technically impressive than I had ever imagined. Right. This was the work she did to hunt down Nazi spy rings in South America and so, and doing it all through through just brute force uh, code breaking of of intercepts. Yeah, saving saving Jagger Hoover, <laughs> helping yeah. Jagger Hoover do the job that he was not he was not able to do only only to have credit stolen stolen from her after. The and, war. Yeah. Well, well, I think we we all have. <laughs> Uh, we have the the complicated picture of J. Edgar Hoover uh, firmly in our in our sights now, having having I'm sure all of us um, learned a lot about him. But yes, he took he took the credit, and of course at the time, uh, and you know I think probably less so now, but it I'm, still happens today that that there's a, a degree of uh, latitude that uh, a lot of men um, exercise in taking credit for work of of others and certainly of women and but again that the, at the time it was probably more um more in keeping with the norms of the day that a man would have done done this work would have led this work would have been the one to have been directing it, and all along it was elizabeth i think hoover um, hoover was hoover was unique in his in his thirst for publicity i mean there were plenty, yes. plenty of men who, who despised hoover in his day as well <laughs> yeah yeah, very, very much so. And what's interesting too there is, and and for you know, this is not spoiling anything in the book, Elizabeth was in some ways already a celebrity because she had already testified in open court uh, against gangsters, Al Capone, I think even. Yeah, and, this is one uh, of the most fascinating parts of her story. I mean, she, during prohibition, um, she was recruited by the Coast Guard to break codes of rum runners for smuggling liquor. Um, they were using, um, you know, radio sets on, on, on their ships and pirate radio stations on shore to coordinate their shipments and, and escape the Coast Guard. And they were just winning and winning and winning. The Coast Guard couldn't touch them. And um, until Elizabeth came in and started to break the codes um, and uh, decrypt these messages and systematically, you know, over the course of tens of thousands of, of messages, she didn't just, you know, solve solve the messages and reveal what the uh, rum networks were saying to each other and how they were doing all of this stuff. She she sort of worked her way into their into their skin. She she uh, learned the names of their ships, the names of their captains. She mapped their routes. She created a you know a kind of a thirty thousand foot zoom picture of their entire underworld network uh, on the seas and and she and the Coast Guard uh, were able to use that to start to catch these guys. And then when they would catch these guys, you know, prosecutors, of course, would want to, you know, make a criminal case against them in, in, in court. But that had to happen in an open courtroom. And because the key evidence in those cases were, were these, uh, you know, solved, uh, intercepted messages that Elizabeth had, had produced, uh, they couldn't get convictions against these guys unless Elizabeth would walk into the courtroom herself. You know, that was a very dangerous thing to do because because the rum networks were uh, dominated by uh, mafias uh, in, the, in the 1920s and 1930s. And so so you would have the spectacle I and mean, it's irresistible for reporters. Just imagine there's there's a there's a trial in New Orleans in 1933. More than 20, you know, uh, uh, top rum runners of the day are, are in court being charged in this huge case. Some of them are, have links to Al Capone. The defense lawyers are Al Capone's lawyers. 
And into the courtroom walks, you know, a five foot three woman, you know, a mother of two in a pink dress with a pink hat and a flower pinned to the brim. And she walks into the courtroom and takes a seat in the witness stand. And she proceeds to just demolish the defense case, explaining exactly how she, you know, solved these messages and essentially stole the words of these uh, gangsters from their own lips. And, you know, it was dangerous. I mean, she, she sort of shrugged off the danger uh, when she was asked about it, but um, the government was concerned enough about her safety that they assigned Secret Service men with guns to, uh, to guard her. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was rough work, but she was, uh, she was the best at it. God, Kim kept her, <laughs> kept her head in more ways than, ways than one through the whole thing. That alone, I mean, is, is an amazing story. And I think something that should have, uh, you know, come down to us in, in the 21st century as a, as a story that we, that we knew. But of course, uh, as we know from lots of examples of where, you know, really uh, amazing, innovative, uh, inventive work that was done by women uh, just in the 20th century alone has been hidden. And, you know, the famous Margaret Shetterly book about hidden figures um, at NASA is just there's there are lots of these stories now that are emerging. I, I think, um, you know, as everyone knows, my background is in tech. Uh, going back to the 1980s. And uh, partly coming in, I was uh, actually a history major. That's where my, my interest in history started. Didn't come in as a, um, a, a, a technically trained person uh, into this field. And so that probably, uh, probably contributed a bit to my sense of feeling a bit like an outsider, but some of that was because of gender. And that in turn was because all of the, the image of tech, the image, the role models were all male. So, you know, as we learn these stories um, and we discover that, oh, women were not only obviously instrumental in fields like cryptography, what three quarters of the people at Bletchley Park in England were women, code breakers. Um, uh, women programmed the first computers. They essentially created software development. I mean, not to, overstate it too much um, and and on and on and of course we have the we have the amazing stories of the women in, at NASA and and many other places and those stories are still coming out so I think for for many of us all of us who well now we're all in tech right or adjacent to it um, it's it's both it's mind-blowing it's fantastic and it is maddening that we didn't know this beforehand and the degree to which that that uh, just speaking personally, how much that would have meant in terms of my own sense of belonging. So again, your your efforts here to bring Elizabeth's stories story out is is so important, and, and I just want to toss that out. I think as another I think theme here, um, certainly for this this summit and for people who are attending, is is your commitment to bringing those stories forward is so crucial, and we need to be doing more of that. I think that's really beautifully said. Um... I mean, what this book taught me is that when you go back and look at the historical records, you realize that women have been there the entire time. You know, women, marginalized groups, people of color, yep. you know, often in invisible ways, you know, they, they didn't get paid for it. Uh, they didn't get recognized for it, but they were there. You can see it in the, in the documents. You can hold the documents in your hand. Um, you know, that for me is a huge takeaway. So, so maybe one way to start to recover these stories is you know, when the pandemic is over, we can get back inside, inside buildings and libraries again, and we go back to the archives, you know, we treasure and we seek out our, our special collections archivists um, who are amazing people. We, we, we continue to be very nice to our librarians and, um, and, we, and we, go, we go back into the archives, right? We plunge back in. Yeah. Well, and, and get these stories out. I should, this is probably a pretty good place to um, give, you, give you a little plug. You've got an email newsletter where you, that you're using to talk more about Elizabeth and uh, I assume other, other interesting um, characters that you come across and people can subscribe to that. We'll put, we'll put it in the chat for people to, uh, to get the link. Um, I think, uh, you know, if there's also just be interested in whether you're, you're doing anything with respect to yeah, reaching out to school children. I mean, how much of how much of this needs to get into the curriculum that, uh, to the extent that we're teaching um, these kinds of things in in K through twelve? Are you are you finding yourself called on to do any of that? Um, yes. So 
so I think I think it's hugely important for for these stories to kind of be woven into and integrated with the consensus, um, you know, view of of intelligence history, and and I think that needs to happen at pretty much every level, right? Um, K through twelve, um, you know, when um, school kids learn about uh, where technology comes from, uh, this is this is part of that story, right? Um, right, right. At collegiate level too, um, you know, I've I've talked to um, professors who teach uh, the history of intelligence, who teach cryptology, and they're very interested and 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 uh, and fascinated with with these stories. It, you know, I think a lot of them, you know, they knew a little bit about it, but they didn't know the the full details. And and now that's uh, you know now that the the richer story is getting out. Um, they're totally happy uh, to integrate it into into what they teach, and so um, and I think that's that's part of what helps helps these stories uh, you know thrive, survive, uh, have longevity, and become kind of embedded um, into the way we think about uh, the way we think about the past. And I mean, for me, that was that became originally when I started working on the book. I was just driven by the sense of wow, this is an incredible story, right. and and it's right here. And I, if I don't if I don't tell it, then someone else probably will, or maybe not. Maybe no one will ever tell it. And it's just, it's too good of a story to not to not be better known. But the more I worked on it, the more I was kind of driven and motivated by a sense of um, trying to restore an accurate version of history that had been that had been distorted or uh, or concealed. Yeah, yeah, which is which is really great. I should also um, put in a, a little a little plug for something that will be coming up through the center, which is that we've got a. A group of interns who are working on some short bios of a lot of other female pioneers in in generally cybersecurity, um, and and we'll be making those those kind of short biographical pieces available um, on the CWIT website and in other forms too. So um, even even sometimes very short little um, windows into into that history can 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 be enough to give people a fuller sense of things and. Um, and I think also, you never know, I mean, how many of, I'll just say this to the attendees out there, how many of you get the bug, as Jason said, to go into the archives and, and see what you can discover too. So um, hey, I've got can a, ask yeah, you a question, go ahead. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, so, um, so in your career, um, when I know that you were working on some of the forerunner uh, networks of, of the internet, right? I, I mean, something about Elizabeth that I, that I was always curious about was, you know, to what extent did she understand that she was doing work that would end up being groundbreaking? And and I wonder, I wonder when you were sort of working on some of these forerunners to the to the internet, did you, did you have a sense that this was going to be world changing, or were you just kind of looking at it as a cool problem to solve? Yeah. Um, so so I I was at the University of Michigan in the um, well, really, until I moved to Bloomington in 2005, but I was there. Um, I grew up in Ann Arbor, and I and I was uh, working for the the Merit Computer Network that runs MishNet, the statewide network. So I got into networking very early, and in uh, 1980, and um, which was right when the TCP/IP protocols that underlie the internet um, still today, and in many places, a lot of that technology is starting to shift. Um, were being standardized and they were being first rolled out in, in the research education community. So the National Science Foundation issued a um, uh, call for proposals, which the University of Michigan won to operate NSFNet, which was the first nationwide um, long haul computer to computer network. And I just, I, I was there with, you know, hundreds of other people who happened to be kind of a, uh, really more along for the ride. I was not directly involved in, in any of that work, but was, was there working primarily on how to make it clear to others that this was something useful. So to your question, you know, at the time, all of us who were kind of circling around this whole area were captivated by it. I think we we got that this was going to change. It was certainly changing everything about computing, right? I mean, this was the dawn of the personal computer. It, it was decentralizing computing. That it was a huge seismic shift yeah. in how uh, technology operations went forward. So all of that was apparent. I think uh, you know to the extent that people could foresee its impact on the commercial world. I, I have to say, a lot of the people that I Hung, hung out with had a somewhat more um, starry-eyed view 
of the benign nature of what the internet could do. I mean, it's everything we've heard today and it's the, you know, it's the philosophy behind a lot of social media, the idea that information needs to be free. And I think we're now seeing, you know, now almost 50 years in, we're seeing perhaps some of the ways in which um, the same technology can be used a little differently. So, um, so I don't know, I think, I think I sort of felt like it was both. And I think that everyone that I was around understood this to be game changing. Um, but certainly, you know, I think I, my, my view was the research education community. And when I went to internet too, that was across uh, higher ed and industry labs, government labs, um, and certainly in those environments, very much on an uh, discipline by discipline basis. So it was transforming astrophysics and it was transforming um, nuclear physics um, and, and um, music theory um, because of a lot of the ways that you could, you could analyze sound and so forth. So. I think it's, I think it's very similar, similar for Elizabeth, the way that she viewed it, as far as I could tell from, from her letters and the research, I think, I think she understood in, in the same way that she was at the beginning of something, right. But she didn't know where it was going to go. She couldn't really anticipate a lot of the, a lot of the negative impacts that would come later. And, sure. yeah. and she was just deluged with work, you know, she, she, she used to, Later, she, she tried to explain to interviewers how she invented all of these, you know, new, um, new code breaking methods in her 20s in the space of a couple of years. And she, she wasn't able to really give a, a clear answer. She, she said, I was too busy either getting on this swing or getting off that one. You know, it was basically just, she was just solving puzzles on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and, but yeah. it, was invention, it was an invention under pressure. But, you know, she, you, as you pointed out, she had the, this theory, this um, kind of mantra of don't throw anything away. So, you know, I think that, that that kind of speaks to the fact that she recognized that, you know, it was important to keep track of how she did these things. And she, and she was also a teacher. I mean, she was training other people. Um, I'm going to ask just one more question, and then I want to open things up. So, so if people out in the audience can be thinking of questions they'd like to ask Jason. Um, but I, I want to talk about this, you know, the, the time frame in which Elizabeth was doing this work, you know, which, as you say, spanned both world wars into, well, really, almost into the Internet age. Um, and so she, you know, I sort of was thinking about this, is that she and her husband, William, kind of went from being, being the computers, you know, that's what they call these women right. who crack codes, to using a computer. And uh, and, I, and I wondered how much came out in what you read about how uh, Elizabeth thought about the techniques, the principles, um, as, as she made the transition to diff using different tools. That's a great question. Um, Elizabeth adapted. She was very adaptable. Often she adapted much better than William did. William was a little grumpier about technology. He was, he was more of a curmudgeon. Um, at NSA, in, in his later years, he was famously an opponent of, of using computers to, to break codes. He, he didn't think that they added anything. Um, he thought that they got in the way. Of course, that's the direction that everything was going. Um, you know, Elizabeth was a little bit more open-minded. She, she mainly resisted computers because she thought it wasn't as much fun to use them. She liked the, the feeling of seeing a, you know, a solution appear at the tip of her pencil. She liked that kind of tactile, um, that tactile feeling of it. She did, she did um, show a lot of adaptability and flexibility in World, World War II because there was a moment when the uh, Nazi spies stopped using traditional pencil and paper methods to encrypt their messages, and they switched to using cipher machines, and including some of the most secure cipher machines that were available at the time. So there was a, a cipher machine called the Kraya that some of the German spies were using in South America. Elizabeth broke that. Um, they were also using um, a, a certain type of Enigma machine. Um, you know, other, other varieties of Enigma, of course, were, were in wide use, um, you know, in German military and intelligence circles. The, the spies in South America used a, a subset of the Enigma machine. Um, that was a little bit more inferior than some of the top models, but still very tough to break. Um, Elizabeth broke those Enigma machines too. Um, and she did use uh, some early kind of punch card techniques uh, statistical analyses and some very early, early uh, computers that were available to her. But I think largely she, she continued to use the same pencil and paper methods that had always worked for her. And, and the, the incredible thing about that to me is that 
for Elizabeth, you know, breaking an Enigma machine was not anything special. It was just another code to break. It was just another puzzle to solve. She was looking at, at a page of, um, of ciphertext. It was just another message that she couldn't read that she needed to read. So she, she did not romanticize it. She did not see it as a huge mountain to climb. Um, you know, for her, it was just another thing that she wanted to read and couldn't read yet. And, and sh she never really found any, uh, any system that she couldn't break, um, you know, from the time when she was in her 20s. So when she started to face Enigma machines in World War II, it was the same thing. So this is just another, this is just another day's work. And that, that to me is, is, is part of her, part of her power and part of her immense, uh, immense achievement. Yeah, she just she just came at it as you say is another another um, and in you know I was there's a there's a story in the book about um, well one of the things that William Friedman did was to break the Japanese codes during World War II and was uh, the the scene in the book is is interesting in, on so many levels one of one of the reasons is it was actually a woman on his team one of two women on his team who who finally saw the the one clue, right, that 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 led to that thread that probably to unravel the whole thing. Um, certainly, that Friedman certainly understood that that was uh, utterly game changing and and you know it, absolute turning point in the war in the Pacific. Um, but he never so, told Elizabeth. He never told Elizabeth. Oh, Elizabeth. So yeah. So I wanted that was another another and I've, again. Everybody should be putting questions in the chat, please, please, um, or the Q and A. Um, get your questions in there. But I did want to ask you about that too, because they uh, they were sworn. Obviously, these were, they were working for the government. This was wartime, and they had to keep they had to keep, and they could not even talk to each other about what they were doing, which is really um, must have been incredibly difficult because they had been collaborators for so long um, through their their careers, and obviously could help each other uh, quite a bit. Um, but that had to have been enormously difficult and psychologically difficult and emotionally difficult um, over a very long period of time. Um, and you know, as we know from your book and others, William Friedman did struggle with depression. Um, and you know, maybe that was part of his, um, uh, as you said, his 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 grumpiness and his his just he was he was a somewhat more troubled soul. Elizabeth seems to have weathered some of that better. Now, maybe it came out more strongly in her letters, just how difficult it was to have to keep those secrets. Um, but I also wondered if maybe the fact that she wasn't expected to be doing this somehow because it was, she was kind of playing against type as a woman, that that kind of gave her some cover and made it easier perhaps for her to feel like, you know, she just didn't need to talk about it. I think maybe she had a little bit more distance than him. And I, I think maybe she was, she was a little bit more uh, emotionally protected from it because she never really wanted to be a code breaker in the first place. I mean, she, she complained all her life that she wanted to do other things. You know, she wanted to be a children's book author. She wanted to, um, you know, be an archaeologist. She was fascinated with uh, Mayan, uh, Mayan codes, for instance. Oh, yeah. But, but, you know, men from the government kept showing up on her doorstep asking her to solve puzzles for America. This was her constant complaint. Men from the government keep showing up on my doorstep. And they won't go away until I solve these puzzles, but they always come back with more. So, um, so she, was, she was kind of a reluctant code breaker for much of her career. But, but you know, your question about, about how they couldn't talk to each other about what they did, to me, that's, to me, that's the sad part of their story because, like you said, they were so connected especially in the beginning of their careers. I mean, they were sitting across the desk from each other for years in their 20s, solving puzzles with, you know, joy. And, um, and it was fun for them. It was something that they loved, you know. Um, I mean, they even included codes in their, in their love letters to each other, which is one of the first things that I read in the library that sort of, you know, got me interested in, in, in doing this and made me, uh, made me completely infatuated with the Friedmans as people. Um, you know, but as they as they went on in their careers, their paths diverged. They they started working for different parts of the government, and they were they were not allowed because of secrecy reasons to um, to talk to each other about their work. I mean, William complained once that if it were up to the government, then he and Elizabeth would sleep in separate beds. And there's something to that. I mean, it's really it's really sad. The, the day that William and his team at the army broke purple, this Japanese cipher machine that you know, this incredible feat that's been, you know, um, written about a lot. 
and had it had a major impact on the course of World War II. You know, the day that that happened, um, William came home from work and he looked at Elizabeth and he said, uh, "What's for dinner?" And that was it. And that that to me is really that to me is really is really sad. It was it was a um, a weight on both of them, and um, and it it was a long time until they were able to work together again. It wasn't really until you know when they were older in their retirement when they were when they were able to find their way back to each other um, and solve puzzles together again. Yeah, we've got a few questions cropping up here. Um, I'm just going to grab a, a few. Hopefully, we'll get through all of them. What impact do you hope? Uh, you've said a little bit about this, I think, already. But what impact do you hope Elizabeth Friedman's story um, uh, will have, could have, should have on young women today? So, so I, I hope I hope that it shows young women that and reinforces that they they um, should not listen to anybody who tells them that they don't belong <laughs> in this field or any technical field, right? Um, it's not only that they belong; it's that they've always been there, right? Like this is this is your place. Um, uh, this is your place. So don't don't uh, don't listen to anybody who tell, tries to tries to get you out of the like, like you belong here. Um, and I, I also think that it um, I think that it shows the power of uh, a different perspective, um, the 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 power that another perspective can bring to a problem. Uh, somebody from a different background. I mean, the, the, the thing that helped me relate to Elizabeth and one of the remarkable things about her, I think, is that she, she came to code breaking as a poet. You know, she, she was not a trained mathematician. She, she went to college and studied uh, Shakespeare and Tennyson. Um, and when she started to break codes, um, you know, she, she had a different way of looking at it. She understood the rhythms of language in, in a way that other people didn't. And, um, and I think that perspective, you know, she just had a different idea about how to solve problems. And I think that perspective was essential. You know, it, made, it made an enormous impact, obviously. And it did, but it didn't just make her successful. It made so many other people around her successful, right? Um, and, um, and so I think, that, I think that it shows that uh, uh, you need to have a lot of different people in the room. Um, and people who, people who are interested in sort of taking technology apart and putting it back together. I mean, another thing about Elizabeth is that she was just intensely interested in sort of opening up a bit of technology, you know, getting our hands dirty with it and teaching other people how to do that too. And so when I talk to, um, to young people, um, there's a lot of interest in, you know, in sort of like hackathons and, uh, right. and interrogating, interrogating the, um, you know, looking, looking under the hood, um, looking behind the curtain of tech, understanding how algorithms work, um, you know, all of that, all of that is hugely important um, to question. And I think it's completely in keeping with the, you know, the tradition um, of democracy and teaching and sort of hacking and puzzle solving that Elizabeth represents. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump around with some of these other questions. There's, there's one about how she got involved with code breaking. And I'm just going to say, rather than having Jason speak to that, you'll, you will, you will come to, to learn that story if you read the book. And that part of her story alone is a whole book. So uh, that, that treat awaits you. But um, do you, and I, and I think I know the answer to this too, because I've heard you speak to it, but well, how did Elizabeth what were her, what was her, her view about the fact that she was overlooked, the fact that J. Edgar Hoover took credit for her work? How did Elizabeth react to that? And did you see evidence of her resentment come through in her letters? She, uh, I'm sorry, my dog just walked into my room. So <laughs> ha hazard, hazard of soon, <laughs> hazard of soon, thank you. Right. He's not so well behaved. Um, he's, he's very sweet though. Um, so, so she she disliked J. Edgar Hoover intensely on a personal level immediately, <laughs> as 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 a number of people. Um, uh, but I think that um, I think that as she as she got older, she she started to realize how much of her own history had been obscured, and um, I, you know she was a very modest person all all of her life. She she was very reluctant to take credit for things. And, and I think that that innate modesty, you know, was contributed to the fact that her story, I mean, hidden for so long. But it's also really clear to me in her letters, uh, particularly her letters after World War II, that 
that she she sort of she came to believe that what she had done was important and was worthy of, of being written about. And she actually wanted to write a memoir herself. She 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 planned a memoir. She she wrote notes for it. Um, uh, there's a little literally a you know a four to six page um, you know start of a prologue to a memoir. I think it's called notes notes on notes on a memoir or something like that. I don't remember mm -hmm. exactly, but um, but she tried. You know she started to she started to write her own story when she was in her 60s and it's it's sad because she she never she never did you can see that she 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 tried to begin but she was thwarted by um by secrecy regulations she, her, her her world war ii records were only declassified i think in you know a little bit after 2000 yeah so even she didn't have access to to her own her own materials from the coast guard during world war ii so so it wasn't just that you know, she, she 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 didn't want to write her own story. It's that she 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 did not have the access or or the ability to do that. Yeah, um, we have a couple more questions here, and I'm going to reserve the last one, um, uh, moderator privilege or something. Um, your book was so well written. I agree with that. That's a comment from uh, one of our attendees. Totally agree with that. Um, how many drafts did you go through uh, as you were researching it? Oh my gosh! <laughs> Lost count. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a, a constant process of revision. So it's it's not necessarily that there are distinct drafts, right? It's it's more like in the old days of the internet when a JPEG would render, it would be you know very blocky at first, and then there would be subsequent versions that would be less and less pixelated. It's, that's kind of what it kind of what it feels like uh, to revise a long manuscript. But I would say probably, probably there were there were four or five um, fairly fairly distinct versions of the manuscript in terms of structure, and a lot of things were, you know, were being changed and were kind of up in the air until, you know, until the last couple of months before before it got locked. Um, you know, these these long these long book projects are always kind of right at the limits of your your own brain's ability to to manage. So. Um, so, uh, so it, it, yeah, it was a lot of a lot of revision, really, quite a yeah. lot. Yeah, and did you have to go back into the archives and 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 uh, you know, and maybe change a bit about what uh, where where you were taking a particular thread of the narrative? Sometimes, sometimes you know, sometimes when you start to write, you realize that you don't understand something as well as you thought you did when you were researching. And reporting, and so sometimes, yeah. sometimes you have to go back and look at records again, or find new records to um, to refresh your memory and to to enrich the explanation, make it make it really you know tight. So, I, so I, I did find myself doing that a number of times. I I went back to the library, you know, in the beginning of the book, I spent two and a half weeks in Lexington, Virginia, um, and just went to the library every day and went through those twenty two boxes from start to finish from box one file one all the way to the end. But I ended up going back um, for several days, you know, I think about a year, year and a half later to um, to do that work of, of you know, re-immersing myself in a couple of important records and filling out filling out some uh, some key sections. Yeah. Um, we are just about at the end of our time. I want to just say a couple of really quick kind of announcement things. One is that there's a, a UITS is sponsoring a book club uh, that will read The Woman Who Smashed Codes. I think there's information about that in the chat. It's every Thursday starting April 1st, I believe, through May. Uh, they're going to do this every Thursday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. There's a Zoom link you can join. You've got the link to Jason's newsletter. And the other thing that um, I, I meant to mention at the beginning, um, going back to Elizabeth Roots, Elizabeth's roots in Huntington, Indiana, is that thanks to Jason's efforts and the efforts of Justin Troutman, who is who's actually going to be doing a code-breaking workshop right after this session, you should definitely go to that. Um, there will be an historic marker um, installed in Huntington uh, that, that is going to be uh, done this August. Her birthday is August 26th, I think. And they're doing that on her birthday. It was supposed to be August of 2020, but obviously the pandemic made that impossible. We will be in both through IU and CWIT and other offices at the university um, will be involved in creating some kind of celebration. Um, so to stay tuned for details about that. And if any of you feel like you 
want to drive up to Huntington, you'll be able to do that. Um, so I'm going to close. We were talking about uh, several people commented on how well written your book was. Um, I really thought it was beautifully, beautifully written. And I want to end by reading from it. Um, uh, uh, it's actually the last bit of your book. It's a beautiful paragraph. But I think it also, I hope, will speak to all of the, everyone out there, regardless of what age you are, who, you know, when you discover something, um, because I think it speaks to the spark that you can feel sometimes when you know you're, when you know you belong. Um, so the, so here's the paragraph. She stares at the odd blocks of text and starts to flip and stack and rearrange them on a scratch pad, a kindling of letters, a friction of alphabets, hot to the touch. And then a flame catches and then catches again until she understands she can ignite whatever she wants, whenever she wants, that a power is there for the taking, for her and for anyone, and nothing will ever be the same. The ribs of a pattern shine through. Something rises at the nib of her pencil and her heart whomps away. The skeletons of words leap out and make her jump. Jason, thank you for that beautiful, those beautiful words and for bringing Elizabeth's story to us. And thank you for being here today. Thanks to everyone who joined. Yeah, you read that beautifully, Lori. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. And thank you to, uh, to everyone who watched. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.